Welcome to Matthew 4 4 Church. We're so glad to be here this morning. And like my dad said, I'm very thankful of my mother's birthday. Very thankful to have both my of my parents. But uh, there are certain things that we remember. There's memorials. In the United States where we live, there's a memorial set up for Memorial Day. We remember that. It's a very special time. We remember those servicemen and women that have laid down their life that we might have the, the freedoms that Brother Craig was talking about this morning. The freedoms to have our Bible and be able to assemble here. And we know that we won't always have those freedoms, but we're very thankful to have them as well. But there's also other memorials. I had an opportunity to watch about the tomb of the unknown soldier. Has anyone ever visited that or or uh, seen any of it? Oh, it's very neat. You know, all right, I found this out in 1921. It was after World War I. There were a lot of soldiers that were unidentifiable because, because of the, the scenes of the battlefield. They didn't know who they were. They would just mark them unknown. And so in 1921, there was a tomb set up in Arlington Cemetery, a very special tomb. It's the tomb of an unknown soldier. And they lowered down this soldier that was unknown in that tomb. And so it not only represents him that's laying there, but it represents all of the men and women in battle that have died. And, and those that never got to receive their families, never back to them, their body. They can at least, you know, go there and just that's something special for their family. And I want to say that being a, a guard of that tomb is a very serious matter. Only 20% of the military men and women, I think it's in the army, that volunteer for that position get accepted, their application accepted. Then they, and they go through a rigorous thing. It takes a year for them to learn to be a tomb, tomb guard and to go over the set the the, uh, the ceremony and all that. And they have to be in tip top shape. They have to be well disciplined and only a small amount of people get accepted for that position. And then they become a tomb guard, men and women. They're, and they're serious about their work. If you ever notice how carefully that they inspect the person that's coming after them. I mean, they look them up, up and down, they look over their weapon, make sure that they're capable of guarding that tomb. And although that it, it looks kind of ceremonial, if anyone crosses that barrier line, they'll find out fast it's not only ceremonial. They are guarding that tomb. I've even saw this one where a soldier pointed his weapon in the vicinity of someone and cocked it. He means business. They, they will have respect for that memorial, for the people that have laid down their life. Well, I'd like to ask a question this morning. Does God have a memorial? Yes, yes He does. Does God desire that His work to be remembered? Yes. yes. Come with me in your Bibles to Psalm 111, 2 through 4. Psalm 111, 2 through 4. through four. The works of the Lord are great, sought out of all them that have pleasure therein. His work is honorable and glorious, and his righteousness endureth forever. He hath made his wonderful works to be remembered. He made them to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion. So what can we see from those texts? We see that the Lord desires that we remember his mighty works, doesn't it? Oh, yes. And uh, when we look at the Lord's mighty works, we, we look back at creation. Naturally, it's his first mighty work that he has done. Oh, there's many other mighty works. But we look at creation. And so for us to get a better understanding of what this memorial might be, we need to go back all the way to creation. So come with me to Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. We're going to 
going to uh, have a, a workout in, in the Bible this morning. We're going to be looking at many texts. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. And it tells us, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So what do we see here? We're looking at the creation of our solar system, our our neck of the woods, however far that that extends in, in God's plan. And we see that the earth was made, the heaven and the earth, that would have been the Lord making the uh, the earth in its, in its uh, without form and void state. And we also know that the Lord made light that day. So on the first day, we had the Lord making the heavens and the earth in, in its uh, un, without form state and then light. And then we go on through, we see the different days. And in your Bible, you might have the headings on there. You see on the second day, the Lord made the firmament. And then on the third day, the Lord made the land and the vegetation. I'm going to put this back here so I can get my Bible closer to me. Well, we see that the third day, the Lord made the seas, the land, and the vegetation. The fourth day, the Lord made the heavenly bodies. And then the fifth day animal life of the sea and the air like the birds and the fish the fishes in the sea and then on the sixth day the lord made animal life life which would be goats like goats that we love and the elephants and, and horses and those type things but the lord also made man didn't he? and he made man and man was a very special creation the lord made man in his own image and i find it interesting that adam Okay, the Lord made Adam, and then he asked Adam, the Lord asked Adam to name all those creatures. And so they came before him, and then he noticed something. He named them all. He noticed something. He said, they all have a mate. They all have a mate to be with, but I don't have one. And I know that was delivered. It had to be delivered. So when the Lord gave him his wife, he would appreciate her much more. And then the Lord made Eve, and she must have been the most beautiful uh, woman ever, ever created. I don't mean anything to the other women, but I mean she, you know, she was made from from God and, and taken from the rib of, of uh, Adam. So our our great 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 grandmother was made uh, from the rib of Adam. And we need to understand that every person on this planet, doesn't matter what color that we are came from Adam and Eve. Amen. Every single one of us. Amen. But from one blood came all men and women. So the Lord created the heavens and the earth. Now let's come to Genesis 2 and let's pick up on verse 1 to 3. And it tells us, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the hosts of them. And on the seventh day God ended his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because the, in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. Now, we need to look at this a little bit more microscopically. What, what does it, it, it tell us? It tells us that the Lord rested on the seventh day. He rested. He blessed it. He put a blessing upon the day. And that we can receive that blessing when we observe it. And he sanctified it. Now, sancti that word sanctified means that he made it holy. And he set it apart for a holy use. So we see that all the way back into Genesis. And so uh, we know that it was, it was made for Adam and his descendants to follow. Okay. There were two institutions that were set up in Eden. Before sin came into the world, what were the two institutions? Marriage and Sabbath. Marriage and Sabbath, yes. Marriage between one man and one woman and the Sabbath. That was before sin came into the world. And so when Adam and Eve left the garden, did they still remain married? Yes, they did. And then they passed on that marriage um, the ceremony to their children. They passed that on. And so they passed on the Sabbath as well to all that would that would believe the Lord. Okay. So now we're going to move up in time all the way up to when 
the Lord brought the children of Israel out of Egypt with a mighty hand, and he took them out to Sinai, and then he gave them his law. So come with me to Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20, and uh, 8 through 11. Exodus chapter 20, verses 8 through 11, and this is the Lord speaking with his own mouth. This is this is uh, before the, the actual Ten Commandments were written and given to Moses, but the Lord was proclaiming them in the, in the hearing of all the people. And it tells us, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work. Thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and he rested the Sabbath day. So the Lord asked them to remember it. Now, does the Lord ask you to remember something that you've never heard about before? All right. When we were children, Whenever we came home from school and our mom said, son or daughter, do you remember that I asked you this morning to take the trash out? She's reminding you of something that you needed to be doing that she told you before. And she's not introducing that to you, right? So the Lord's saying, remember. So he's, he's asking them to remember the Sabbath day because it had already been into effect. Now the Lord's going to tell them, how did they're to observe the seventh day, which we just read. He tells us that in six days thou shalt labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. So he also tells us how we're going to observe the Sabbath and what day of the week that it's going to be on. And it says, it's the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. It's his Sabbath. And he's the one that tells us how that we're going to observe it. But then notice, he tells us a reason why that we, he wants us to keep it. Verse 11. For, and when it says for, it means that this is the reason why that, you, that I'm asking you to do this. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day, wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. So, dear friends, the Lord is, is telling them that, you know, I want you to keep the Sabbath. And he tested them on that point as well. But I'd like for us to go all the way up to Mark. Mark chapter 2, verse 27. We're going to see some words that Jesus said. Mark, 20, Mark chapter 2, verse 27. This is Jesus speaking. And he said unto them, The Sabbath was made for man, and not man for the Sabbath. Now when we see the, the word man, we understand that that means mankind. I wouldn't doubt if there's some translations that were translated that. Because you know that's what it means. The Sabbath was made for mankind, and not mankind for the Sabbath. Therefore the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. So what did we see in Exodus? It says that it's the Sabbath of the Lord thy God, right? And now Jesus is telling us that therefore the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. And it tells us in Revelation that John was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. That would have been on the Sabbath. And so anything that has to do with Jesus, our Savior, and His day, we need to pay close attention to, don't we? Amen. So man, uh, the Sabbath was made not only for uh, Adam and Eve, but for all mankind. So it, it can't be limited to just any certain group of people, can it? It has to be for all of mankind. Now, the next text that I would like for us to look at is Exodus 31, 17. Because remember, the Lord's been telling the children of Israel that I want you to keep the Sabbath because... I made you, I made everything. And just in that, just in that por portion of the scriptures, we should have enough information to know that we need to honor and keep the Lord's Sabbath because he's our creator, right? But come with 
with me to Exodus 31, 17. Exodus 31, 17. And it tells us the Lord introduces something else that we need to be thinking about in observing the Sabbath. He says, It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made heaven and the earth, and on the seventh day he rested. So we're seeing the Lord again remind them, I desire you to keep the Sabbath because I made you. I created everything. That's the power that I have. And you are mine. And I desire you to keep my Sabbath. Now, he starts to expand more about this because there's so much uh, in depth in, this, in the study of the Sabbath. Come with me to Deuteronomy 5.15. Deuteronomy 5.15. turning, I'll just to remind everyone that the children of Israel had just been brought out of Egypt, out of bondage, out of cruel hard bondage. And the Lord tells them in Deuteronomy 5 15 And remember that thou was a servant in the land of Egypt and that the Lord thy God brought thee out thence through a mighty hand and by a stretched out arm. Therefore the Lord thy God commanded thee to keep the Sabbath day. Now look at this. There's a there, there's a, another uh, dimension here added. It's not only that the Lord created us. It's because that he brought them out of bondage. Now just think about that. The people were in Egypt. They were slaves. They could not worship the Lord they wanted to. They had no power. They had to do what the taskmaster said. And think about it. Seeing your wife, your mother, and your children. Slaves. And there was not one thing they could do about it. And then the Lord brought them out with a mighty hand. But what did he have to do first? A sacrifice had to be slain. The Passover lamb. The lamb had to die. And the Lord brought them out. He gave them his law. He gave them a better understanding of himself that they might know him. And then he was taking them into Canaan. Now what can we learn from this? There's a parallel. There's a lesson here. Egypt represents the world and sin. And Pharaoh represents Satan. And everyone, before we give our hearts to the Lord fully, are in deep sin. We're slaves. We can't do anything about it. We can't stop um, doing the, the sinful things that, that our heart puts in us. We want to smoke. We want to drink. We want to curse. We want to evil surmise. We want to gossip steal, whatever. Whatever it is, we want to do those things. We don't have any power. Satan is a cruel tyrant. He has them in his hands. But then what does the Lord do? He sent his son, Jesus Christ, that lamb that died for you and me, that we might have forgiveness of our sins and have a new life in him. And he brings us out of there. We're taken out of sin. We're not slaves to sin anymore. No. And then he teaches us his law. He teaches us his Sabbath. He teaches that to us. And he prepares us to enter into his heavenly kingdom. And so there's a lot of people, Christians in the world, that don't understand the Sabbath yet. But those that are truly seeking the Lord will because that's something that he desires them to understand before he can take them into heaven. Because we know when we're in heaven, you read in Isaiah 66, that we will be observing the Sabbath won't we? Amen. You know, the Lord expands upon this, expounds upon this in Ezekiel 20, verse 12. Come with me there. Ezekiel 20, verse 12. It's a good thing to, to open up the Word of God. Ezekiel 20, verse 12. And the Lord expounds upon this. Now notice, as we said before, the Lord had been pointing to His power in creation... But now he's pointing to something out, to their deliverance in regards to keeping the Sabbath. 20 verse 12. Moreover also, I gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign between me and them 
that they might know that I am the Lord that does sanctify them. Now think about that. He's saying, I gave you the Sabbath that you might know, that you personally might know that I am the God that sanctifies you. Notice verse 20. And it tells us, And hallow my Sabbaths, and they shall be a sign between me and you that you may know that I am the Lord thy God. Now, I want to ask a question. It's presented to us that the Sabbath is the sign of our sanctification. How could this be? You know, years ago, I was thinking about it. I was pondering. How, I know that the Bible tells me the Sabbath is the sign of my sanctification, but how can that be? I, I didn't understand it. And beloved, I want to tell you, when we have something on our heart, when we have something we're studying, and you take it to the Lord, He's going to give you that answer. It is time when we're ready for it. But beloved, the answer in the spirit of prophecy tells us that the mighty work of creation is evidence that God can have a mighty work to change your life. I'm not quoting that exactly, but that's the case. The mighty power in creation is a mighty power in redemption. It takes a miraculous power to change our life, doesn't it? I'd like to read something. This is from Bible readings from uh, from the home circle. It's a very old edition. And this is in page of 420. Sanctification is the work of redemption, of making holy sinful holy beings. So the Lord is making sinful holy beings holy. Like the work of creation itself, this requires creative power. And as the Sabbath is the appropriate sign or memorial of the creative power of God, wherever displayed, whether in creation, deliverance from human bondage, or deliverance from the slavery of sin, it is to be kept as a sign of the work of sanctification. This will be one great reason for the saints keeping it throughout eternity. It will remind them not only of their own creation, in the creation of the universe, but also of their redemption. So now the Lord has presented to us that because I've saved you, I want you to keep the Sabbath. Now the question is, all right, we see that God, we can't, um, we see clearly that in the scriptures that the Lord desired all of Adam's descendants to be keeping the Sabbath. And we can see clearly that the Lord was telling the children of Israel to keep the Sabbath. But did the spiritual seed of the children of Israel, the Christians, were they keeping the Sabbath? So that's something that we need to look at this morning. Come with me in your Bibles to Acts chapter 13, verse 42. Acts chapter 13, verse 42. And before we, we look at this, what year did our Lord and Savior die for us and was resurrected? Was it 31? 31 AD? And then the gospel uh, stayed into the Jews uh, for three and a half more years. And so 34 AD it went into the world. Now, the gospel had went out all the way up into a place called Antioch. And that would have been in modern day Turkey. And it's interesting that, all right, I'm, I'm blessed in my Bible that I've got some dates on, on my Bible. So, AD 41, it tells us in uh, Acts chapter 11, verse 26, and the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. So, that's interesting. They were first called Christians in Antioch. So, that's very important. And Antioch became a very powerful uh, center for, for Christianity. And so, whenever we get into Acts chapter 13, that takes us all the way to 45 A.D. So that's 14 years after the Lord's death, burial, and resurrection. The gospel had already been taken into Antioch. Paul had already been to Antioch, and he went on his mission journeys. But then he came back into Antioch, and it tells us that he went into the synagogue on, it would be on the Sabbath day, of course, he went into a Jewish synagogue and he started uh, listening. He listened 
And then the, the one of the elders stood up and said, if uh, Brother Paul and Barnabas, if you have anything to say, go on and say on. Now, it's interesting that there are Jews and Gentiles in this synagogue. Notice in verse 16. Then Paul stood up and beckoning with his hand said, Men of Israel, and ye that fear God, give audience. So see, there are converts to Judaism, and there are uh, Jews as well. So come with me, if you would, to 42. Now, Paul started preaching the gospel. He started sharing them about Jesus Christ, how that the Lord had raised up of the seed of David a Savior, a Redeemer, and he didn't, and he died for their sins, and he tells them how their, their rulers killed Jesus, but the Lord didn't re let him remain in the grave. He raised them up, and he's a Redeemer. He's the Lord of life, and you give your heart to him. You will have salvation and have a new life in him, and Paul is preaching the gospel. Now notice what it says in verse 42. This is very interesting. Now remember, we're look, we're trying to find out if the Jew, the Gentiles kept the Sabbath, the Gentile Christians. Verse 42, and when the Jews were gone out of the synagogue, the Gentiles besought that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. Now when the congregation was broken up, many of the Jews and religious proselytes that would have been converts followed Paul and Barnabas, who speaking to them persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. So notice the Jews left the, left the synagogue, and then the Gentiles that were in there listening to the gospel, they come up to Paul and they said, Paul, we want to hear more about Jesus Christ and his power. We want to learn more about this. Now remember, it's 14 years after the Lord's resurrection. Did Paul say, well, brethren, I've got good news. Your day of worship is tomorrow. You don't have to wait until next Sabbath. Do you think that Paul wanted to immediately share the gospel to them? Oh, yes, he did. But notice what it tells us. And the next Sabbath day came almost the whole city together to hear the word of God. So the Sabbath was definitely uh, a commandment. The Lord desired that his people kept his commandment, commandments. And when we look at through the scripture, and through history, the Sabbath was observed in the early Christian church by all Christians. There were, there were none that kept any other day. It was only the Sabbath. And it was a blessing to them. And it wasn't until maybe, uh, maybe uh, I've heard like say 150 B, uh, AD that the first fragments of Sunday worship started coming in and you had later on you had those that all the world kept the sabbath of the christians except rome and alexandria egypt there that was at one point earlier on until finally uh, through different uh, mandates and councils and things by the by the man of sin it ended up being introduced largely to uh, christianity and, and toward that most of the christianity adopted the sunday but it was never in the scriptures given to us to observe Sunday. It was always the Sabbath day. Always. And Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath. I'd like to uh, read just a few things. There's this wonderful magazine uh, called Remember. Remember, it's a, it's a wonderful magazine. And in this magazine is uh, page 20, The Sabbath Across the Centuries. And in the second century, here's something, uh, this tells us the primitive Christians had a great veneration for the Sabbath and spent the day in devotion and sermons. They derived this practice from the apostles themselves as appears by several scriptures to that purpose. No doubt the one that we just looked at had to have been one of those. But this was from the Church of England, uh, somebody more uh, and he uh, presented this in 1707, so he was looking back at the history of the second century. Uh, this one's very interesting. Ambrose, the celebrated bishop of Milan, this would have been the fourth century. Ambrose, the celebrated bishop of Milan, said that when he was in Milan, he observed Saturday, but when in Rome, observed Sunday. This gave rise to the proverb, when you are in Rome, do as Rome does. 
Now, everybody's heard that, haven't they? When in Rome, but well, that's where this comes from. And this is from a high lane history of the Sabbath. In the 8th century, India, China, and Persia, widespread and enduring was the observance of the Seventh-day Sabbath among the believers of the Church of the East and the St. Thomas Christians of India who never were connected with Rome. Now, that's wonderful. And, you know, it takes you all the way up to um, the 20th century. There's just a couple more I'd, I'd like to, to read. Um, the Paulicians, Petrobutians, Pasig Pasiginians, Waldenses. We had the chance to go to the Waldensian Trail. That was a blessing. Uh, in, in Sabaton were great Sabbath-keeping bodies of Europe down to 1250. And that's from Col Colthart, page 19. And then there's one more I'd like to read. Abyssinia. It is not an imitation of the Jews, but in obedience to Christ and his holy apostles that we observe that day. And they're speaking of the Sabbath. Speaking of the Sabbath. From an Abyssinian delegate at the church of Lisbon, 1534. So the Lord gave us many reasons that we're to keep the Sabbath holy. That he created everything and we belong to him. And also that he's our redeemer. And he has power to change our life. But there's one other reason that I would like for us to look at. For us to keep the Sabbath. Come with me to John chapter 14, verse 15. John chapter 14. When you have it, say amen. amen. John chapter 14, verse 15. Jesus speaking. If you love me, keep my commandments. Amen. amen. If we love the Lord, that's why that we observe the Sabbath. It's out of a love of devotion to our Redeemer. And we understand the importance that the Sabbath is the sign of our sanctification. So that's very important that we understand the reasons why that we observe the Sabbath. And the final uh, text that I would like for us to look at is in Psalms 11, verse 9. Psalm, no, it's 111, verse 9. Psalm 111, verse 9. And the Lord just presented this uh, to me this morning, this, this text. <clears throat> Psalm 111, verse 9. He sent redemption unto his people. He hath commanded his covenant forever. Holy and reverend is his name. So he sent redemption to his people. How is redemption made? Only through Jesus Christ. The blood, the precious blood of Jesus Christ. He sent it to his people, all those that would accept him and choose him and follow him. And he hath commanded his covenant forever. And that covenant is the covenant of God's law. God is merciful. And he has given us that covenant and that promise of grace. That if we surrender our hearts to the Lord, that he will give us forgiveness and give us power for obedience to him. He sent redemption unto his people. He hath commanded his covenant forever. Holy and reverend is his name. Amen. Dear friends, the appeal from the scriptures is that we choose to follow the Lord in all things, and that we keep his Sabbath holy. Is that your desire, dear friends? If it is, won't you just bow your heads with me in prayer? We're going to close, close our, our service. Dear Father in heaven, thank you so much for thy word. Thank you for sending Christ to die for us. We claim him as our Savior and our Redeemer and our Lord and also our Master. And we want to give you a, a willing sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto thee. And to follow thee as you lead, for you, you are the head of the church. You lead us through thy Holy Spirit. You've given us thy word as the instruction for us. Please help us to always follow the word in every detail, Lord, out of a love for thee. Thank you.
Please do bless this church. Please bless all of us this week. Please help us to love and follow thee and grow in grace. We ask this thing today. And I thank you for helping me to share my gospel. In Jesus' name, amen.